Welcome back, everyone, for our three o'clock session. Um, I'm happy to introduce Nas Nasli Kirkajan, who is our SUNY System EIT Accessibility Officer, and she'll be introducing our next session and our speakers. Thank you so much, Roma. Good afternoon and welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Nasli Kirkchen. I use she, her pronouns. I'm pleased to announce our next session titled Trans Survivors with Disabilities, encouraging providers and allies to think within and outside of the boxes. Our esteemed colleagues from FORGE will provide an overview of the experiences of transgender survivors with disabilities and offer strategies for working with this community. Without further ado, I'm honored to welcome Lori Cook Daniels and Michael Munson to the virtual stage. Colleagues. Thank you. Um, we're really glad to be here again. Um, I know we've been involved with the SUNY conference for many years and um, I'm missing seeing everybody in person. So um, I am here today. I'm filling in for Tristan Taggart and Laurie Cook Daniels, um, like you just mentioned, is also here with us and we'll play a lot of back end today, but um, we have a full hour worth of content and we're really glad that all of you are, are joining us today. So our agenda for this afternoon is to briefly talk a little bit about um, who is Forged, just to give you a rough idea of, of who we are and what services we can offer everybody. Um, we'll talk about who we're talking about when we're talking about trans folks with disability who are also survivors. We'll frame some core concepts that will guide us through the majority of, a, of our time today, which will be about practical and concrete ways of working with survivors who are trans and disabled. Um, and then we'll share at the very end some, some resources, um, just a few resources that you can pursue further. So we um, always have this slide in, in every one of our live and, and webinar presentations. And it's just a reminder to all of us to take care of ourselves. Um, many of us work in sexual assault, domestic violence, um, agencies and do this work all the time, but it can be really difficult and really draining. So um, step out if you need to, grab some water if you need to, stretch if you need to, um, please take care of yourself. I'm gonna turn things over to Laurie, who is gonna share a little bit about who Forge is, and then we'll dive into um, the, the heart of our content. Hello, this is Laurie Cook Daniels. I go by any pronouns and I'm here as Forge's policy and program director. And I have just a little bit to say today. Um, one is to introduce FORGE. We are 27 years old. We are a transgender anti-violence organization. About 25% of our work is direct services with um, survivors, but about 75% of our work is working with uh, service providers and trying to help them better serve transgender survivors. So with um, our service providers, we do things like one-on-one -on -one, um, training or technical assistance. We do publications, trainings, conferences, webinars, site visits. We do policy consultations. We do collaborations of all sorts, and we do a lot of information and referrals. So we kind of have a whole plate full there. Working with survivors, we do online support venues, publications, more conferences for trans, trans related conferences. Uh, we work very hard on empowerment. We do more information and referral. So we've got a lot that we're doing. Um, Michael, go next. We have a very small staff and a large vision. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Tristan was not able to join us today. So it's just Michael and me, but you can see the pictures of our staff. Next, please. We have two guiding principles and we use them in both, both parts of our work. We are trauma-informed with our survivors, um, but we're also trauma-informed with our service providers. Many of our service providers have experienced trauma and it helps to be aware of what they may be carrying as well as our um, the quote unquote survivors, the ones that uh, we all think of. We are also empowerment based and that's both with survivors and service providers. We think it's really important to think about how will a service provider use this? Um, just as it's important to think about how can we help this survivor um, become empowered and make their own choices. Next, please. We have social media, 
um, and that's the primary way that a lot of people connect with us. Um, we uh, please find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, and I will put these back up in the chat in a moment. We have a few closed groups on Facebook for survivors as well. If you are live tweeting today, we'd encourage you to use the Spectrum Conference hashtag, which is hashtag SUNY Spectrum and hashtag trans survivors. Uh, and that's it for me, Michael. I'll turn it back to you. Oh, great. Thank you, Lori. So um, let's frame our discussion by looking at who we're talking about in terms of the population of this workshop. So when we're looking at um, trans survivors with disabilities, we are talking about a whole bunch of people. So folks who have physical or mental health disabilities, folks who are deaf, who may or may not identify as having a disability at all. So that's a whole nother workshop that we could talk about the kind of the divisions or the overlaps between deaf communities and disability communities. We're also including folks who are neuroatypical, um, who might be living with long-term PTSD as a result of trauma, as a result of living in a transphobic world. We're talking about folks that have short and long-term disabilities. We are talking about uh, disabilities that may be connected to transness or survivorship, or may be totally disconnected from transness or survivorship. We're looking at disabilities that are also visible or invisible. So, and that could be true for um, transness or survivorship as well, that visibility or invisibility. Um, on the slide is just a, a, a bunch of folks who many of you might know. They're, they're folks that are doing actively, actively doing trans disabled survivorship work. Um, so um, just a, a great small collection of folks who are doing some of this work. So let me frame some of what we're going to talk about before we dive into the uh, the, the practicalities and the kind of the how tos. So uh, over the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about just you know how we can think about these things before we move into the practical. So in disability communities, there's oftentimes a, a focus on being person centered or using language like person with a disability. And so I wanted to offer that as a caveat that we want to be really respectful of that historical language preference by a lot of folks. And also that sometimes now people are wanting to claim their disability identities as well as their trans identities or survivorship identities as kind of the first thing that they share about themselves or one of the things. So when we say trans man, um, that for example is not putting, you know, man of trans experience, which would be for person first. So um, we're gonna flip back and forth between language of like person with a disability, trans person, you know, and flipping those languages all around. So if you have a preference for the language that you like to hear, I encourage you to kind of switch that around in your brain to work, you know, to fit with what works with you. Um, I will use a couple of language pieces today that are reclaimed languages. So you may hear me say the word crip or mad or crazy or gimp. And I will, you know, state up front that I'm using those words in a very reclaimed way, kind of like how we use the word queer. So again, today is going to be really practical focused. So we could talk about theory a lot, but we're going to really focus on the nuts and bolts of what you can do to make the world better for trans survivors who live with disabilities. So many of you know about adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, and I am not going to talk about ACEs and what they are other than to just briefly mention that we know that ACEs, these adverse childhood ex experiences, which you can imagine what they are, so those things that are about um, childhood neglect, childhood abuse, household structures that um, may not be ideal for the, the health and growth of children, those things negatively impact the health of adults um, throughout their, their whole lifespan. So there's a connection between those negative experiences and what the health outcomes are. So it can be about disease um, or disability or the ability to function well socially um, in the world when those negative things happen as children. <clears throat> 
We've also identified, and I, I won't go into detail about this either, about some trans-specific ACEs. So some of those things like being bullied um, because you're trans, we look at that as, as another ACE that trans people in particular might be experiencing that wouldn't have been included in this very large ACE study um, that was started quite a few years ago. When we look at um, some scoring of the ACE study, um, you can see on the slide that there's some general population and there's the trans population. So more recently, there's been data released about trans communities and ACEs. When we look at things like one ACE, so that's people that have experienced one of these negative experiences in childhood. In general, um, when we look at the general population, it's around 50 or 60% that have experienced one ACE. You can see that trans individuals, it's almost double that, it's almost 100%. So almost all trans people have experienced at least one negative adverse childhood experience. Similarly, when we look at folks who have had four of the identified adverse childhood experiences, we can see that that, that disparity is even greater. So general US population is 20, um, percent who have had four or more ACEs. And for trans folks, it's 60% or higher. So we're looking at some health disparities that are going to emerge out of the fact that people have experienced childhood trauma. We can also frame things in terms of talking about the social determinants of health. So when we're looking at social determinants of health, um, it's a phrase that many of us are familiar with, but these are the conditions that people are born with or that we grow and age into, the things that we live and work with all the time. So those can include things like ACEs, they can include things like if we had access to shelter and food as children, or if we have access to shelter and food now as adults. It might include things about our family or our current financial situation, um, about if we're employed, if we were in school um, and graduated from high school, or if we went to college. It says things about if we have health insurance. It also says things about the connections between where we get our community support and where we get our social support. So all of those pieces together can affect our health outcomes um, in adulthood and, and later in life. When NCTE did their survey of, of a huge number of people, almost 28,000 people, um, when they asked questions about disability, 39% said that they had one or multiple disabilities. So we have a, a fairly high number of trans people who are self-reporting as living with disabilities. I wanted to, again, just in a framing kind of context, talk about spoons for a second. So a lot of disabled folks, a lot of trans folks, a lot of survivors will talk about maybe like not having enough spoons. And so spoons or spoon theory is all about kind of recognizing that we don't have infinite energy, either physical en energy, mental energy, emotional energy for all of the daily activities or tasks that we wanna take on in a day. So this concept was like, okay, we've well got this many spoons, however many this many is to use in your day. How do you wanna prioritize using those spoons throughout your day? So what's most important to you? Is it making sure that you go to work? Is it making sure that you get fed? Maybe it's taking a shower. So how are you gonna use those spoons? And so a lot of people say, I'm out of spoons. So for those folks who live with chronic uh, disabilities, who are um, experiencing a lot of anti-trans um, input from the world, um, those whose survivorship is really difficult, they may say that they're out of spoons a lot. So let's talk about some practical things. We're gonna talk about six practical things that are practical, creative, and ways that you can support trans survivors with disabilities. So the first is um, about pre-checking your space for accessibility. And these are some of the obvious things. And so um, again, I don't wanna talk about things that you can find anywhere that's not trans-specific, but these are kind of the general ones. So you can start with assessing your own space. If you have a brick and mortar building or a brick and mortar organization, think about what your space is or where you host meetings. And think about if it's accessible in a number of different ways. And I'll talk about some of those ways that it may or may not be accessible. Think about other spaces that you may be going to. Like if you're an advocate um, for clients, think about if you go to the courthouse with somebody, if you um, take somebody to medical or mental health appointments, um, if you have access to other spaces, go check out those spaces ahead of time before you might be accompanying a client there. 
So you know what to expect and your client can know what to expect. And if any accommodations need to be made to um, try to make that space a little bit more accessible to that person. And the third thing to think about ahead of time is your own referral lists. So, you know, if you have a therapy referral list that, you know, you, you share with clients to say, hey, this is a really great therapist who's trans-informed and trauma-informed and all of that good stuff, make sure that their, their building, wherever that therapist's office is, is accessible physically, um, is accessible emotionally for that client. So know about those things when you're um, making your referral list mark it in your referral list um, handbook or guide or however you keep it. And also think about things like, do they have an accessible bathroom? So think about trans accessibility and think about physical or mobility accessibility. So I wanted to share a, a brief bit of, of Tristan, who's not able to be here today. We recorded a bunch of um, things a couple of weeks ago on empowerment and healing and connecting, which are which is you know our forges tagline. And Tristan had this beautiful clip talking about empowering disabled trans euphoria. So I'm going to play that for you, and we'll um, jump back in after um, the video is over. This is so great so far. Um, when I think of the empowerment um, work at Forge, I um, I love the emphasis from everyone on how we center the whole person. Um, because as someone who focuses on disabled trans survivorship, um, it's really important to me that I frame empowerment through the lens of disabled trans euphoria um, and access that encompasses disabled trans and survivor identities. Um, because so often um, when we talk to providers um, and do TTA with providers about bathroom access, um, people talk about trans bathroom access, but leave out disabled bathroom access, um, or what it takes to make a bathroom comfortable to trauma survivors um, who may need just like a quiet place to go sit down at a conference. Um, so it's really important to me when talking with providers to center all three of those identities at the same time. So when I think of empowerment with providers in TTA, um, that's sort of what I'm thinking of. And then when I think of empowerment with um, disabled trans euphoria, um, it just, it, it lights up my whole body um, because um, it's the opposite, I think, of what we're taught we're supposed to experience. Um, and it means the world to me that I get to dig in with community into what skills it takes and what kind of conversations it takes to be able to experience that inside our bodies and in our storytelling um, that exists outside of boxes. Um, because Larry is right at Forge, we don't do that trans enough conversation. That does not happen here. Um, and we also do a lot of work to um, deconstruct, um, am I a good enough survivor? That conversation does not happen here. So disabled trans euphoria is about, to me, it's about the empowerment of leaning into our own enoughness um, and how we build that up with each other. And I really see a lot of that happening in our groups and in our one-on-one -on -one work and through blog writing and um, connecting with other survivors at conferences. Um, it just, it's in everything we do. Um, and it's just, it's really good work. So Tristan um, captured a whole bunch of stuff in that three minutes. And um, I just wanted to share it with you because I just think it's, um, they're amazing. And um, they touched on how things are so interrelated and how to 
really look at things in that holistic way. So um, hopefully you heard that as well as, as I heard that, um, because I think there was a lot that was in that short clip. So the second practical uh, creative thing that I wanted to share with you is talking about validating your client's agency. Um, and we can talk about it, this in a couple of different ways. So let's start out with the fact that some folks access traditional Western medicine and some folks don't, right? I think, I think we all know that. And we think about, um, you know, trans folks may or may not access medical care. Sometimes they don't. Um, sometimes survivors access mental health care. Sometimes they don't. So when we look at what we expect of folks, which might be to, well, you know, if you're living with a chronic disability, why wouldn't you seek medical care? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. So I just wanted to hold the space for the fact that people have agency over what choices they're making with their bodies, with their minds, and they're usually making those choices out of um, some reasons that we all might not know about. Um, and maybe we'll get to learn that if we are listening carefully and build the trust with, with folks. A second piece of this is looking at harm reduction and choices. So, you know, similar to the concept of like accessing Western med medicine, many trans folks are um, with disabilities who are survivors make choices on this harm reduction kind of mentality. So from a harm reduction standpoint, some trans survivors, you know, might make choices that don't seem logical to other people, but they might be weighing something that is the least harmful to them. So for example, if, if someone has a physical disability where um, it's recommended by physicians that they have surgery and that would require a long rehabilitation process that involves maybe physical therapy and physical touch, that might be weighed for that trans disabled survivor against how as a survivor or as a trans person, they don't wanna be touched by anybody. They don't wanna to have to be away from their support um, system at home if they have to go to a rehabilitation center. That may be like looking at how it would activate their trauma. So those are some of the choices that person might be make, making just for one example. So there's a lot of things that we can look at with harm reduction and that's just one example. Um, another piece of, of this is around disclosure or the concept of masking. So people can decide obviously to disclose their transness, their survivorship or their disability. Um, any of those things, all of those things. And there are lots of reasons why people do or don't disclose those things. And sometimes it's a combination of, of those things. So this sounds like a trans 101 and I'm not trying to make it be a trans 101, but people may choose um, to disclose or not disclose for the reasons of simplicity. They're gonna have a, a one-off interaction with a provider. They're not gonna ever see them again. So they may choose to not disclose um, either their trans history or their disability history or their survivorship. Um, they may um, fear bias from that provider. They might have concerns about having compromised care if they do or if they don't disclose. They might just not have enough spoons to disclose whatever piece of themselves that others might expect them to disclose or want them to disclose. And all of those choices are really valid. And people may make different choices on different days and we can try to support them as advocates and professionals and those who might be working with them um, to support those choices. Um, I, I sometimes use this example, um, a, a personal example of mine, which is, you know, about what I choose to disclose when I go to a medical provider. So, you know, some people ask, well, you know, do you disclose that you're trans? Do you disclose that you have long-term disabilities? Do you disclose all of these things? And my answer is almost always, if I am going to like the emergency room or a care provider that I've not seen before, the most important thing that I want them to know is that I'm allergic to parabens and I'm allergic to local anesthetics. That is the absolute most important thing to tell them. So again, when we look at trans survivors with disabilities, all of those components might not be what is most important to them to share with a provider. So again, we can affirm what is most important and validate that and try to support them in um, reaching those goals. The third piece about kind of practicality and working with, with clients that are trans and disabled and survivors is managing our own responses. And um, I know that seems really obvious, but sometimes I think we all get surprised or taken aback by something that we aren't expecting. Um, and I wanted to share a little bit of a story with you um, that happened really recently. Um, 
I, I was introducing a new um, a new person to a colleague of mine. And um, Jordan is this great person and um, this colleague is a great person. And I didn't tell Jordan very much about this, my colleague, other than, you know, they're really smart. They're an excellent writer. They're really trauma informed. Um, you're going to really love working with them. And that's all I told Jordan. And so Jordan and I were on a Zoom call and we were the first two to get there. And my colleague came in, you know, a few minutes later and one of the first words out of Jordan's mouth was, oh my God, are you okay? And he was surprised because my colleague regularly wears a cervical collar um, to support um, the, the neck um, muscles to, to hold, hold their neck up. And it's an everyday thing for this colleague of mine, but for Jordan, it was like, he was really concerned that something had happened rather than it being a disability that was more long-term and something that happened. So, you know, it's hard to sometimes not be surprised by things when we think about it and we want to express concern if we think it's something that's acute. Um, but sometimes those things are really about chronic disabilities. And what was really beautiful about this interaction was that we were all um, super good adults and we all had some conversation about it and we all worked through that. Um, and my colleague and I worked extensively on the issue of should I pre-share with any new person or how did they want to handle that? So we had a long discussion about if there was a way that I could help so that they wouldn't have had to experience again Jordan's response, which was just a natural response, but Jordan felt immediately bad about it. So again, we want to be careful to try to not say, oh my God, and be really surprised. We don't want to show sympathy to people because disabled folks and trans folks and survivors don't need sympathy, um, don't need pity. So all of those things go together. And again, it's really hard to be prepared for what we're not prepared for. So, um, but we can handle things with, with grace and, and move forward. A fourth practical thing is to create access at events and services. So this might sound like the Disability 101 piece. So let me just share with you a few of the things. We could spend hours you know, talking about how do we make events more accessible? How do we make services more accessible, like support groups? How do we make our buildings more accessible? How do we do all of those things? Let me just touch on a few of those things. I'm going to touch on five things. We can look at having ASL. So I know that a lot of um, organizations are grant funded and ASL can be really expensive. So can live captioning. And I just wanted to remind folks too that for a lot of um, folks who are deaf, especially deaf from birth, that ASL is their primary language. So offering captioning is not necessarily gonna be access for folks that are deaf whose primary language is ASL. So we wanna make sure that we ask deaf clients, for example, you know, what is your primary language? How can we make sure that this service is accessible to you? And that might be hiring ASL. It might have captioning and ASL. So a lot of those things, we need to have some discussion, but it's really important for us to put in our budgets to have ASL, American Sign Language, or captioning available for support groups, for Zoom meetings, for in-person events, for any kind of services that we offer. It's really key that we use image descriptions and image descriptions can go in a lot of places. So I think most of us are using um, them or thinking about them when we do social media, but image descriptions can also go on our website as um, tags that are like underneath the, the image so you wouldn't see it unless you were using a screen reader. They can go in newsletters, they can go in lots of places that you have an image. So what's on the slide right now is, um, I've given you an example of, I think this was a post from yesterday, of a quote from Susan, Susan Stryker. And um, I'm, I'm sharing with you the, the image description that we used for this particular um, post. So it's as simple as saying, you know, image in a bracket and then black background, Susan Stryker dressed in black, looking intensely, legs crossed with notepad on lap quote text because the quote text was in the post and then forge logo. So the, the image descriptions can be really simple, but they're really, really important for folks who are not able to see the images and want to know what your content's about. We want to look at things like physical accessibility. So there's a lot of things that we can do about creating a space that's physically accessible. Um, again, we can think a lot about, you know, are, are the doors to enter the building wide enough for a wheelchair? Are, the, are there push buttons to open the doors electronically for folks that may not be able to pull the door open? Are the hallways wide enough to navigate? 
if we set up rooms with um, rounds of tables, is there enough room to navigate safely between those tables? Are the bathrooms accessible? And again, when we think about Tristan, are they accessible in terms of what genderedness those bathrooms are? But also, you know, is the bathroom free of scent? Is it, um, you know, does it have a large enough stall for somebody to navigate um, for, for transfer if they need to? All of those things that you can learn more about um, in lots of different ways. Um, Lurie will put in the chat um, one of my favorite resources, which is the Vera Institute of Justice's Designing Accessible Events for People with Disabilities and Deaf Individuals. And they have a lot of tip sheets on, you know, creating spaces that are um, accessible for like, um, you know, how do you find a, an ASL provider that is going to work with trauma survivors and disability? How are you going to, you know, find all of these things that will go together to create a good space? Another piece about spaces is thinking about things like um, the sound, the smells, um, the, the lights, and things to stim or not stim with. So when we look at things like quiet, you know, Tristan talked about like, you know, is there a bathroom that's safe so that there's some quiet time if somebody needs to go to it? So my question to you is if you're hosting an event at, you know, a community center or wherever it is at a university, is there a quiet room that's designated? Um, that's totally quiet or very, very quiet for somebody to go if they need to have that decompression zone. So that can be about disability. It can be about, um, you know, trauma. It can be about transness. Um, there's a huge number of, of trans folks that are on the autism spectrum or the autism kind of pool of folks. And um, sometimes STEM devices are really helpful. It's also really helpful for folks that are survivors or who are nervous. So are there things like the image on the screen has a couple of uh, fidget toys, basically. They can be as expensive or cheap as you want them to be. They can be Play-Doh, um, anything that people can touch and play with. Um, so it works for lots of people for lots of reasons. We also really want to think about is the space that we're hosting an event in or our own organizational space, what kind of sense are in that space? So is it about asking people that are coming into the space to not wear deodorants or colognes or things that have scents? Um, or is it about what cleaning solutions do we use to clean our bathrooms or our, you know, our floors? Um, and to make sure that those things are not overpowering and ideally are not scented at all for folks that have multiple chemical sensitivities. We also want to think about if the lighting in a building is um, adjustable. So it could be the lights in a room when there's a PowerPoint so that people can more clearly see the PowerPoint. It could be about lights that are not fluorescent, that don't flicker and cause more um, headache related um, or uh, seizure related activities. It could be about, is there a blind for the window if something is too bright or not bright enough? So those are just some kinds of thing, things to think about that relate to all of these components that we're talking about. And the last thing about um, creating accessible events and services is around transportation. So um, many of us who work at victim service agencies um, oftentimes have grant funds for things like getting people to and from places, whether it's to and from appointments or to shelter or to our services. And when folks are living with disabilities, um, it's hard to order sometimes a cab or an Uber or a Lyft that's going to be, um, that's gonna work for folks that, that live with disabilities. And that could be mobility disabilities or uh, mental health disabilities. So um, for example, at Forge, we have had to work with some of our grant managers to say, you know, ordering a, an Uber XL, so a larger sized Uber is not being extravagant. It's not wanting to have higher class service or whatever you wanna call it, but our client, you know, can't bend their head to get into a, a more typical sized car. So they need to have, you know, like more of an SUV type car to be able to get into. Or we have a survivor who's extremely claustrophobic because of the trauma that they experienced and they can't get into a Honda Civic because they will just freak out and they won't be able to get to our services. So when we're looking at, at those access points, we sometimes need to talk to our grant you know, managers, sometimes we need to have our budgets be a little bit bigger for transportation. And sometimes we need to offer transportation like Ubers and Lyfts versus a bus token or something that's more um, less costly. So the fifth thing about practicality, if we shift gears, is to acknowledge multiple ways of coping. 
And I'm going to share three things with you about multiple ways of coping and how we can validate and acknowledge them. So the first thing is around chemicals and meds. So trans folks, disabled folks, survivors may not access traditional modes of care um, for many different reasons because of, you know, fears of discrimination, for fears of not being able to get the services that they need, um, lots and lots of different reasons that many of us are well-versed in. We may know that our clients are using chemicals to um, support their healing, to support their uh, pain management, to maybe reduce their anxiety, to help them move about their, their normal day in the best way possible. And so that might be um, an including of, of things like marijuana or other forms of drugs that are oftentimes illegal in some places. We also know that community members sometimes share their meds. And again, this is all about harm reduction. If we go back to the harm reduction model. So what is the best way that that person can manage their pain, manage their anxiety, manage their depression, make sure that they have their trans-related care needs met? Sometimes it's with these non-traditional ways that might be viewed as illegal by some folks, but is life-saving um, by the folks who really need to pursue these routes. Wanted to talk about um, another way that we can acknowledge a coping and survival strategy, and that's through non-suicidal self-injury. So if we look at the general U.S. population, it's someplace between 4 and 13% of the general US population that engages in cutting or other forms of non-suicidal self-injury. When we look at trans folks, um, Laura Dickey, um, great researcher, did a, a study in 2015 and found that 42% of the trans population um, that, that he looked at and, and, and worked with were using non-suicidal self-injury for a variety of different reasons. So, I'm including this here because sometimes, again, this is a life-saving thing for people. This is how people are coping and surviving. That might seem counterintuitive, right? Um, this is not about suicidal behavior. It probably is not even about depressive behavior. Um, for some people, it's about when I cut, I don't feel as much of my chronic pain as I would if I didn't cut. Or for other people, it's like, if I cut, I won't engage in suicidal behavior. So there's a lot of things that can happen when people are engaging in this kind of behavior that we don't necessarily want to report to somebody that would then end up institutionalizing this person when there's no need for institutionalization. A third piece of acknowledging the multiple ways that people can cope and survive is through um, people engaging in adrenaline or sedating activities. Again, we wanna just acknowledge that this happens and why it happens is about their survivorship, their disability management, all of those pieces. So people may engage in driving their car really fast because it creates an adrenaline rush and an endorphin rush, and that reduces their pain, for example. Um, people may engage in bondage or SM as a way of either kind of creating a calm environment, like through bondage um, or through some sensory deprivation or through pain again, which can alter that daily experience of pain from disability. People may engage in things like, you know, float tanks or floating in swimming pools. Um, again, just ways to change their body chemistry in a way that traditional Western medicine may not be able to. Um, the people that do things like the cold plunges on, on New Year's Day boggles my mind why people would like would want to go into Lake Michigan or wherever in the freezing cold, but people do that sometimes because it changes their chemistry and it allows them to function better after they've done something like that. So again, just acknowledging that people use some maybe non-traditional or ways that you may not have recognized um, to cope with the symptoms of what they're experiencing. The sixth thing that's about practicality is about checking in about who knows what. Um, and this can be really broad and wide. So when we're thinking about the who knows what, I'm, I'm talking about outing and privacy and confidentiality and all of those bits and pieces. And it can be about transness, survivorship, disability, any of those components, all of those components, how they overlap, overlap or interact with each other. Um, but what's really important for those of us who are advocates um, or working with trans survivors with disability is to make sure that our clients have agency. 
So to allow them to, you know, choose who they are are disclosing to, who they're not disclosing to, um, what pieces they bring forward, what pieces they don't want to bring forward. So all of those things are things that we want to follow our clients' lead on. We all know that, but it's just a reminder that when we add in these multiple complexities of, of identities or experiences, it may be both harder to keep track of what the outness level is or what the disclosure is and what our clients may want us to do to support them. Let's look for a moment at uh, disability justice and what care work is. And we could talk again for hours and hours and hours about what disability justice is, what transformative justice is, how they overlap and interact with each other, um, but we don't have that time. We've got an hour. So in our last few minutes, I'm going to spend about five minutes on this video, and then we've got some resources to share, and then some possible time for, for Q&A before we um, all move on to the next section. So I'd like to share with you this video clip um, that's called Intersections of Disability Justice and Transformative Justice. And it features two folks that many of you may have heard of. So one is Elliot, and I, I never know how to say their last name. Um, I think it's Fukui. Um, and then the other person people may have, have heard a lot more of is uh, Leah uh, Lakshimi. Um, and then the last part of their name I can never get right. So Laurie just put it in the chat. So you've got all of their names. So let me share with you this video, and we'll then move towards resources. So disability justice is a term that was coined by Patty Byrne and the Disability Justice Collective, which was this amazing crew of disabled, badass, mostly queer and trans people of color. Disability justice is really looking at creating a world where everybody, every mind, uh, regardless of how it's shaped or moves or functions in the world, um, has a place and understands that disabled folks have a lot, a lot, a lot to offer um, to our communities. And in the same vein, it's it's grounded in the agency and self-determination of a person who identifies, um, you know, like I identify as neurodivergent, um, that my agency and self-determination is prioritized uh, over, right, things like the medical industrial complex or saying that there's something wrong with me. Transformative justice is also about agency and self-determination, right? And people have understanding that we are all empowered um, to change our lives and to change behaviors and to transform the culture that we live in. Uh, disability justice is also trying to transform the culture that we live in to be you know, bigger and allow for more agency and self-determination from more of us. So that intersection is a super sweet spot because yeah, we're all fighting for that same thing, which is that we get to exist in the world without fear of harm just because of who we are or how we move through the world. As someone with, um, who is neurodivergent and with disabilities. Um, like a, a lot of how I entered into this work was through my own lived experience of trying to A, be accountable to my community and be able to show up for my community as someone who you know very frequently has to take moves back because of how my mind and my body function. Um, but also for care to become a collective thing. Disabled folks, you know, we've never been able to rely on. Uh, a lot of the systems that are in place or those systems have been incredibly harmful to us. More than 50% of people who are murdered by the police are people with neurodivergence or who are neuroatypical or have cognitive disabilities, right? So for a disabled community, this is also about us staying alive. I think everyone should have a safety team. Everyone should have a community that um, loves them enough and unconditionally. Having a safety team has enabled me to be outside, to be a part of my community, um, and it also is a preventative tool. Uh, my friends know how to support me and take care of me so that I don't end up outside while I'm dissociated or episodic, which means I have less interactions with police officers, which means I have a less lesser chance of ending up back inside or really harmed by the state or the system. So when I think about transformative justice and community accountability, and again, that intersection, right, is like, this is really about um, going back to what we know is true, that our relationships are the most valuable resource that we have in, in maintaining our agency and self-determination, in getting the love and care and support we need to survive, and in shifting, right, 
shifting our culture kind of from the inside out. From a disability perspective, so many of us who are disabled like live in a lot of isolation because of ableism. So, and I mean, that can happen for people who aren't disabled too. I think that's true for a lot of survivors and a lot of people that they're like, what community? So I guess I also want to give a shout out because I think, you know, like community is a word in community accountability, right? And I think often there there is still this focus we have on like, oh my God, this great network of community is gonna be there and it's so wonderful. And a lot of us actually have a much more mixed experience or we're like, actually we're loners, we're hermits, we're, there's a lot of stuff that we don't actually have support around or we're actually kind of isolated. And I guess I kind of want to give a shout out to like people who might be watching this video who are living alone in their apartments or their lives who are still building lives that have safety, peace, justice, and healing, and to say that that's real too. So I think that is a fantastic, really short video that covers a whole bunch of things. Um, there's a longer conversation with both of those two people. Um, and I'm, I'm leaving this screen up on purpose because the Barnard Center for Research on Women did um, a series of events with both of them. And it, I encourage you to go look it up and to go find the fuller um, discussion because it's really quite amazing. So I'm hoping that you heard some of the, the really um, really critical pieces of disability justice and where that lands for some folks. So um, they were talking about agency and self-determination. They were talking about, um, you know, what is it like to uh, get to exist without fear um, from the systems, from harm, from what happens when we don't have agency or self-determination. Um, I love the concept of, of a safety team and how that is preventive. And so I would, I would encourage you all to think about what, what is a safety team? What is your safety team? What is your client's safety team? Who is that made up of? Especially when some people might be, um, like Leah said, you know, like loners or people that don't necessarily have a lot of connections. So how can we help people create safety teams or community-based teams that can know someone, can help them with standard operating procedures so um, they can stay as safe as possible and as healthy as possible. And I mean that in the biggest, broadest way for healthy. So um, I encourage everyone to think more about what does uh, disability justice look like? What does transformative justice look like? How do those things overlap and interact with each other? Um, and getting to know what some of those roots are of where these um, theories came from and how we put those theories into practice. So let me share with you a few resources before um, we wrap up today. Um, there are not a huge number of resources that cover all of these connected overlapping identities and experiences, but I wanted to highlight a few of them that may be good jumping off places for folks. So the first one is, um, you know, who you just saw on film, um, their resources are just fantastic. Um, if you have not read Beyond Survival, which is probably the most um, well-known book um, that Leah has written, or The Revolution Starts at Home, both of those are just like, I think they're like absolute core reading for folks. Um, but I also, you know, have recently been exposed to, and I hope many of you have also been exposed to, um, you know, the Care Workbook, where it's about dreaming disability justice. And um, all three books are just incredible. So um, I strongly recommend all of them to folks who, who like to read or get somebody to read them to you, which is, um, it shares the knowledge even more that way. Um, Eli Clare is another author who I think is just um, phenomenal and uh, writes from a very, very different perspective, um, writes almost exclusively poetry in terms of what gets published. So um, all three of these books are, are as well, just incredibly powerful, um, come from, again, this perspective of a trans survivor living with disabilities. So Exile and Pride, which I think was Eli's first book, um, the second one, I believe, was the Morrow's Telling uh, Words in Motion. And then the most new book, I believe, is Brilliant Imperfection. So um, Eli on their website also has a bunch of videos of some of the talks that he's given. So I encourage you to check out um, Eli's website as well. Um, so I mentioned the tip sheets um, earlier on about how to create spaces and events and meetings and all of those things in a more accessible way. 
Um, the Vere Institute of Justice has an enormous number of resources on disability justice, disability access, um, enormous. And um, this is one starting place that you may like to go to get some really practical ideas of how to set up registration, how to set up physical spaces, how to set up, you know, all of those nitty gritty things about making your support groups, your events, your all of your things that might be meeting in person or meeting online more accessible to um, a wider range of folks with a wider range of abilities or disabilities. Um, I wanted to share with you this, this older webinar that we did, um, which still has a lot of really, um, I think, interesting ways of looking at things, which is very different than what we've shared today. So this was a webinar that we did with the Vera Institute of Just Justice, or rather for them. Um, I believe it was in 2015, so it's five or six years old. Um, but again, I would encourage you to go check it out. Um, it's a, an easy listen. Um, but it has some different frameworks that may help folks think about things again in a little bit different way. And I wanted to mention our Trans Survivor blog. Um, it, it's a cool resource, not because it's ours, but it's a cool resource that has many different types of blog posts, um, reviews of uh, books and other materials. And Tristan, who's not here with us today, um, who's our disability, I never remember their title correctly, but they do a lot of our disability work. They have written um, probably about a third or more of the blog posts. And some of their writing is just, well, all of their writing is just really brilliant. So I encourage you to um, go check out the blog, look specifically for Tristan's um, pieces, which you will see the integration of all of these three components coming through in, in what they write. And as Lorena mentioned in the beginning, um, we love to be friends with people on social media. We can't keep up with everybody, and I know nobody can keep up with everybody, but um, we strongly encourage um, connection, and that's the way that we can share information with you. We get information from you, to you, all of those good things. Um, so that is um, actually the content that we had today, and I'm really surprised that we're at nine minutes out before the hour, which is amazing. Um, so I don't know if we can open up for some questions or comments or dialogue. Does that work? I'm seeing some I, nodding. Michael, um, we do we do have a, a question that came in earlier. Great. Someone wondered if you could share some of the results of the discussion you had with your colleague about pre-warning others. Yeah, so that's a really good question. And um, we had a really, um, it was a very sensitive, but very bold and very real conversation, set of conversations. Um, I don't know, probably a dozen or more email conversations because that was the preferred method of communication. So we wanted to figure out, first of all, what the language was about, were we calling it warning? Um, were we calling it pre-share? And we ended up calling it pre-share. Actually, they ended up calling it pre-share because that was their preference. Um, and so they did want to have some pre-sharing happen um, in the context of what I would normally do to introduce them to a new person. So how I would normally introduce, like when I introduced them to Jordan, for example, by email, I my initial email to Jordan was like, you know, hey, we're gonna meet with this person. This person is a blah, blah, blah. You know, they do this kind of work, that kind of work. They have these attributes of smartness. Um, and what my colleague and I decided I was gonna do was to add in um, a comment about their disability in that introduction. So I was sharing both their knowledge, their skills, the greatness of who they are. And then I was gonna also say, you know, this, you know, my colleague also lives with a disability that's visible. And very, I forget what the exact statement is, but it was a very simple statement that was added on to the list of other attributes. And that felt really comfortable to them. And um, we haven't had a chance to practice it yet to see if it works. Um, but it was a really good experience to have that discussion without being pitying, without being objectifying. Um, so it worked really well. Thank you for the question. We have another question. How do you handle it when there are conflicting needs where meeting one need creates an accessibility issue for someone else? Yes, that is a huge challenge, right? It's a huge, huge challenge. Um, so let me give you a personal example, and then I'll, I'll broaden that out a little bit. So um, I have some multiple chemical sensitivities, and I also like using essential oils 
and things like Tiger Balm for my chronic pain issue. So I'm aware of the fact that I can't use those things if I'm going into a space that needs to be scent neutral. So it's gonna be in contradiction with people that need to have a scent neutral space. So sometimes it really is a difficult thing to try to navigate like people who need high levels of light versus people who need low levels of light, um, people who may, may need high volumes um, of microphone like amplification versus those who really need quiet um, spaces. So, you know, with some of it, it can be adapted. So like the noise one, for example, um, you know, we can create things where we offer folks who need lower levels of sound um, headphones that will mute the sound a little bit or earplugs that will help mute the sound. So that will hopefully like create a little bit of a balance, but it's really difficult. And I don't think there's an easy answer to it at all. It's a great question though. It's a really great question. I'd be curious if other people have suggested answers for that one. Cause I think that a lot of us struggle with that um, a great deal. I'm seeing that, that somebody wrote, um, sounds like creativity and resourcefulness is key. And it is, it really is. And some of it too is like, if, if you're creating a large scale event, so like if, if this conference was in person, it's a really different kind of space that you're creating that may have conflicting or non-conflicting disability needs versus if you have a support group that has eight people in it. Like creating that eight person support group might be a lot easier to navigate those needs than looking at 400 people at a conference where you don't, you're not even gonna know what some of the people's needs are and hard to predict them as well as not to be in conflict with each other. Michael, if I, if I might add, you know, I think that you know, the intent is to create environments that are as universally designed as possible to reach the broadest possible audience. And so try to do your best to reach every possible audience and um, you know, be as inclusive as possible, whether it's translation or having a sensory room at your physical conference for someone to escape to, or uh, a room for parents um, to go and, and um, uh, take care of milk or something like this, like, you know, and having all of those questions up front, like you suggested um, with those Vera resources, like having all those things up front and gathering that data up front can help you better inform the participants what their experience might be like and help you better um, accessify the ex mm -hmm. experience, if you will. Exactly. And I think building off of that too, that we can be trauma informed in how we um, share information with potential attendees. So, you know, if you know ahead of time that it's going to be a set free space, and I'm just picking on that for an ease of one that sometimes is difficult for folks to comply with. When you send out, you know, the confirmation of, you know, hey, we're really glad that you're going to join us at this in-person space, you can say, hey, you know, and we, we really ask you, if you can, to please not wear scents. So people know ahead of time what they're going to be entering into, um, or you can let them know that bathrooms are accessible or that there's a um, lactation room or whatever there is so that people know ahead of time, which is a really trauma-informed thing to do. And it makes people feel welcomed and that, they, that you've heard what their needs are ahead of time and you've planned and you've devoted resources, either emotional resources or, or actual practical resources. Thank you for, for adding that. Yeah, the communication is super important, especially for those with mental um, diagnoses who wanna be informed before they enter spaces, what to expect um, or, or other disabilities as well. So that's a really great suggestion. And like we started out with, when we look at, you know, a lot of trans folks have that, dis have disability and survivorship and all of those things that go together. So, you know, it's really, really important to be as upfront as possible and, you know, put it out there. So, yeah. And I know we're almost at the top of the hour. So thank you very much for um, spending time with us. And thank you for hosting our, our session today. And um, we look forward to connecting with folks. We're very grateful to have you here. This was wonderful information. Um, thank you and Laurie and, and Tristan, send our regards uh, to them as well. So we're very uh, fortunate that you were able to give us such practical advice. So thanks again. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Um, we will reconvene here at 4.30 for um, another really exceptional session. Um, it's gonna be peer art support groups with trans survivors.
Um, we're really, really excited and um, grateful to our colleagues from Forge uh, for joining us as always. Um, you all have been really wonderful partners over the past few years. So thank you. Um, thank you, Nasli, and we will see you all at 4.30. Just to let folks know, we'll be starting in about four minutes. <laughs>